Yeah, yeah, but I don't know if Desmos would do the job. Uh, in statistics, it doesn't do much. It does a little bit, but uh, in statistics, it, you probably still need, you know, just programs. You will see it's uh, very sophisticated when it comes to doing statistics. Okay, class, uh, class width. What did we define the class width to be? Maximum value. minus minimum value divided by number of classes. And remember, round up. Lower class limit, its lowest value in the class. Upper class limit, largest value or you can say the beginning value and the ending value um, class it's an interval range of values frequency how often a value or values occur, you just count them. Histogram, bar graph where the bars are connected. Or touch, no gap. Relative frequency, how do you find the relative frequency? It's the frequency divided by the total of all frequencies. Frequency of class, divided by total of all frequencies. Uh, stem and leaf plot, I think we did this. Stem and leaf, uh, leaf plot, it's a graph where data is split into stems and leaves. And don't forget here, guys, provide a key. All right, that's, uh, that's very much what uh, we have done. Uh, resume recording. All right. This is a blank to write notes on it if you need uh, to, if you have a print out. Okay. This is what we're going to learn now, section 2.3. So in section 2.2, guys, you only need to know what a stem and leaf plot is. That's it. And construct a stem and leaf plot. Section 2.3, you're going to learn about the measures of center. Uh, many of you hasn't had statistics uh, before, already know about them. They're called averages. But for your information, there are three types of averages. One is called the mean, one is called the median, and one is called the mode. And this is uh, what we're going uh, to define today. Um, why do we need the measures of center? If you see, um, let me, get, let me I'll put this example for you. A graduate teaching assistant student in math was asked to grade 40 final exam selected at random from several large sections of an introductory course. The resulting scores are found below. So these are 40 exam scores. The professor of the class asked the teaching assistant how the students perform. Uh, the students could not tell because you have raw data. The data is not processed. So unfortunately, the graduate students found that looking at the list of scores was about as informative, uh, informative as looking at scrambled set of letters. So to get information out of data, it's nice to find the measures of center. There are three of them, guys. One is called the mean, which is the average that you know of, median, and mode. We're going to begin with the mean. How do you find the mean? The mean, you add up all the values and you divide by the number of values. This is the average that you know of. Okay, you can find the mean of a sample or you can find the mean of a population. 
most of the time, guys, you will be finding the mean of a sample, not the population. The mean of a sample, guys, has a notation. It's called X with a bar on top of it. So when you see an X with a bar on top that the sample, this is a mean of the sample, or they call it sample mean. Now, for population mean, population means, means you already have the entire information about the population. You add up all the values, you divide by the number. This is the mean of the population. And it has a notation like this. It's a Greek letter, a mu. We pronounce it as a mu. But to do the calculation, guys, it's exactly the same thing. This is x bar and the other one is a mu. I'm gonna begin with an example. The following are salaries. I'm not gonna do, probably you'll ask me what happened to you, not just to this example. Well, if I find the mean for you guys, I have to enter 40 values into the calculator. So we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do it at a smaller scale. The following are salaries for four randomly selected employees at Microsoft. Calculate the mean score. Since this is a sample, how do I know it's a sample? Because I know Microsoft has more than four employees, so that must have been a sample. It's called X bar. How do I find it? 130,000 plus 135,000 plus 133,500 plus 136,000. And don't forget, guys, you have to divide everything by four. Okay. To do that on the calculator, let's do it. I'll add him up first, 130,000. I'm gonna show you how the calculator can do that without me doing this work. Just tell the calculator about the data set that you have and it will do it for you. So we add him up and then divide by four. And the mean is 133,625. So this is the mean, this is the average, guys, that you know of. It is called the mean. Now the median. The median is the value in the middle of the data set after you put the data in order. So if I wanna find the median of this data set, I will have to put them in order first from smallest to largest. So it's 130,000 first, then 133,500, plus then 135,000, and then 136,000. Okay, where is the middle of this data set? Here's an easy way to figure it out. Uh, cross one off from the side and one off from the other side. One off from here, one off from here. Oh, it turns out the median to be right here. So what do you guys think the median is? How do I find it? It's somewhere in the middle between 133,500 and 135,000. So what do I do? Uh, it's a middle. Add them up and divide by two. Exactly, exactly. 133,500 plus 135,000. And then guys divide by two. That's how uh, uh, we do it. So that will be... 134,250. Now, let's show you the magic of uh, this calculator. Because you might have a data set that is larger than this one. How would you find the mean and the median? Watch. So now we're going to put this calculator into use. Not to just do when you know just order of operation. The calculator can take care of everything in one sec. First of all, you enter the data set into the calculator and this is how you do it. You go to stat, edit, okay. And you enter your data into a list. If you have a brand new calculator, it should be clear here. And I'm gonna clear this one so that you guys don't get confused. And I'm gonna clear that one as well, okay. You enter the values into the calculator. So let me enter them, 130,000. That's one. 
then 135,000. Then 133,500. And then the last one is 136,000. Okay, so now the calculator has the data set and this is how you find the mean and the median. You go to stat, it's very important key guys. And then you go to calc and just press number one. Okay, the calculator is confirming. Is your data in list one? Then you say yes. You don't touch this one, leave it blank and just hit calculate. Okay, you see the mean guys, 133,625. This is the first value, X bar. Now where is the median? Let me show you where the median is. It's right at the bottom of the screen, 134,250. So this is, you don't need to enter the data in order. The calculator can take care of that. Just you do it, you enter the data and let the calculator do the rest. Uh, you can see here that it says minimum value, which is, this is the lowest wall. So we'll talk about the rest of them, you know, just in a little bit. But for, for now, guys, the mean is the first value. And the median is, you scroll down using the down arrow key to see it, which it says MED 134,250. Any questions? Now, if I have an odd number of observations, how do I find the median if you are doing it by hand? Sometimes it's faster to do it by hand if the data is arranged in order. So let me give you this, uh, this example right here. Two, three, three, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, and then we put another one, 11. Okay, I wanna find, you know, the uh, median of this data set. Okay, look what I can do, guys. One, 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 one. Oh, there's the median. So if you have an odd number of values, the median will be one of the values guaranteed that it's going to be one of the values it is seven you could have put this into the calculator but uh, i wouldn't do that it's faster just to do it by hand especially if the data is arranged in order now my question to you if you have 63 values and they are arranged in order i wouldn't use the calculator if this is the case i can find you know the median right away it takes probably five seconds without even doing this as well how would you do that i have 63 values guys anyone can tell me where would the median be located how would you locate the median how many values did we have here we had seven right okay let me show you the trick if you have an odd number of values seven add one to seven you get what eight divide eight by two you get four count the fourth value one, two, three, four. Now maybe you'll tell me, can I count from the other side? Yes, one, two, three, four, it's the fourth value. So if you have an odd number of values, guys, add one. So I said 63 values, add one will be 64. Divided by two, it's uh, 32. Just count from the beginning up to the 32nd value and that would be your median. So this is a way to do it. Um, the other way is you put them into the calculator, but sometimes it does take time, you know, to do this in the uh, calculator. Now, what about if you have a hundred values? How would you figure out where the mean uh, median is located? If you have an even number of values, I'll tell you what to do. If you have hundred divided by two, you get 50. Your median is located between the 50th value and the 51st. So you just find the value in the middle between those two values. And this is the technique to find the median. Let me, let me demonstrate that to you with uh, another example. I'm gonna put one, uh, eight values. Okay. Look guys, I have eight values. Divide eight by two, you get four. Your median is located between the fourth and the fifth. Count. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. This is your median right here between four and eight. Four plus eight divided by two, which is 
12 divided by 2, 6. This is how you find the median. It's faster than putting in the data into the calculator. If the data is not arranged in order, probably it's faster to put it into the calculator and ask the calculator to do it for you. All right. Mode. What is a mode? That's not much important to us uh, to learn about the mode, but the mode is the value that occurs most frequently in the data set. Um, and let's do some examples on that. There could be more than mode. Uh, when no value is repeated, we say that there is no mode. So if I want to find the mode here, uh, what would be the value that repeats the most here? Can you guys see it? Eighty-four. Eighty-four. The mode is eighty-four here. Why? Because it repeats it three times. Now, if a student says, what about 82? Well, 82 repeats only two times. So then the mode is the one that occurs most uh, often. So this is the mode. Um, what type of data, guys, you cannot find the mean and the median, but you can find the mode, a mode for it. There are some types of data where mean and median make no sense. Only the mode makes sense. Which type? Any ideas? For example, if I ask you what's your favorite color, and you list the colors that you like to me, can I find a mean or a median here? No, this, these are not number, qualitative data. For qualitative data, guys, you only can find the mode. Uh, the mode. Because if you ask me what's your favorite, uh, I ask what's your favorite color, and most of the students, I say my favorite color is red, let's say then red would be the mode because it occurs most often. But uh, it doesn't make sense to find the mean and the median. Okay. Uh, let's fill in some blanks here. Uh, which measure of central tendency do we use for a given data set? Okay. For what type of data the mode is the only one of the three that makes sense? I just talked about it. It's a qualitative data, guys. Okay, what do you think it's gonna be next? For what type of data mean and or median is often preferred over the moon as a, a mode or as a measure of center? Yes. Quantitative. All right. We'll uh, talk about uh, this in a second. And let me tell you uh, what an outlier is. An outlier, guys, is a value that is far removed from the data set. For example, if I ask students, I survey students how much money they spent on lunch if we were on campus at the college. And I get responses from students. Some of them say $5, $2, $7, $6, $6.50, $6 7 etc. And then one of the students said $50. This student decided to go out of the college and eat a nice sushi uh, meal. The $50, guys, doesn't belong to the data set. That's, this is usually called an outlier because it does not belong to the rest of the data set. And usually outliers do interfere, you know, just with the results of the data set and statisticians try to remove them if possible from the data set because they do affect, you know, the data set in one way or another when you do calculations. Okay, I'm going to give you an example the, on the impact of uh, outliers here, guys. And I think you'll find this example interesting. Okay, here's the example. Let's say we have a neighborhood that has five homes. And these are the values of the homes. 72,000, 75,000, 73,000, 80,000. And then there is a, someone bought a triple lot and decided to build a mansion there. 
and the cost of the house is 950,000. Okay, my first question is to find the mean. Okay, and then I want you to find the median. Not much interest in the mode, guys. Uh, it's not very important in statistics. So let's find the mean. Uh, the mean. I'm going to add them up and uh, divide by five. So let me just do it in front of you to have a feel. 72,000 plus 75,000 plus 73,000 plus 80,000 plus 950,000. Add them up and then divide by five guys. And I got the average value of the house 250,000. Now I want to find the median. For the median, I'll do it by hand. I just sort the data in order. So I put 72,000, uh, 73,000, 75,000, 80,000, 950,000. And can you guys tell me what the median is here? 75,000. 75,000. Okay. If you are a real estate agent, you can make this statement. Watch carefully, listen carefully. You want to sell a house, you want to sell this house in this neighborhood. You can make this advertisement and nobody can come after you. You can say, I have a bargain for you. I'm selling this house for 73,000, although the average value of the house in this neighborhood is 250,000. Can the real estate agent make, and I'm gonna find it, you know, just a bargain. When someone tells me I'm gonna give you a house for 73 or 75,000, when the average price of a house in this neighborhood is 250,000, I'll find it as a steal, guys because you're getting something that's worth a quarter of a million for 75,000. But you know what the real estate agent was using? The real estate agent is using the mean instead of what? The median. Can he or she do that? Yes, there is a misleading uh, statistics. And you end up falling for the trap, thinking that you got a great deal, you buy the house for 75,000, and then to find out the reason later why the mean was that much inflated because of the outlier. So if there are outliers in the data set, guys, the mean gets very inflated and we should not be using the mean. Instead, do you think the real estate agent would have been more honest if he says, I'm selling this house with $73,000, whereas the average value of the house is in this neighborhood is 75,000. That is reasonable. So in the presence, guys, of extreme value, they call them extreme values or outliers, you should refrain from using the mean, you should use the median. One of the questions that you will see online, you will have, I'll ask you to find the mean and the median, and then I'll ask you which measure is a better representative of the center. If you notice that there is an outlier, you have to say the median, not the mean, because the mean gets affected by outliers. So if I go back here, if there are outliers in the data, median is preferred over the mean, as the mean can be misleading when outliers uh, are present. <laughs> You're not muted. <laughs> Mute everybody. Now, if there are no outliers, what do you guys think? Well, what preferred uh, as an average will be the mean? The mean is often the preferred choice because 
it has some nice property which will be important in making inferences later in the course. So the mean is good when we don't have any uh, outliers. All right. So this is uh, this is everything about the mean, median, and mode as far as uh, definitions. Now let me explain the weighted mean. That's not very important, guys, but you need to understand that for the sake of even how I determine. Uh, your, I determine your grade. So just to explain the weighted mean for you. Let's say these are your scores on the test. Exam one, exam two, final exam, homework, you got 100%, project 85 out of 100, all out of 100. Your first exam is weighted as 20% of your grade. Second exam is 20%, final is 25%. Homework is 20% and project is 15%. How do I figure out your grade? This is what I would do. I would just take the 20% and multiply by 84. Then I will take that 20% and multiply by 75. Then I will take 25% and multiply by 72. Then I will take the 20% and multiply by 100. Then I will take the 15% and multiply by 85. And then I add them up. I should arrive at the final percentage. So add them up. And let's see what the final average is going to be. So 0 0.2 times 84 would be 16.8 plus 15. Plus 18, plus 20, and plus 0 0.15 times 85, 12.75. And now let me add them up. 16.8 plus 15, plus 18, plus 20, plus 12.75. I got 82.55, which is a B. And that is the final average. So this is what uh, we call the weighted mean. So you take the weight and multiply by the actual value. Weight multiplied by actual value and then add them up. Any questions? All right. This is the end of uh, section 2.3. That's the last statement that we're going to learn here. Okay. When you do histograms, guys, uh, you get different shapes of histograms, and I'm going to show you the most common shapes of a histogram. When you do a histogram, you're trying to graph the data set that you have. And these are called, you know, just the uh, uh, distribution of the data set. This is one distribution. This is another possible distribution. This is a third, fourth. It could be some different shapes, but we are interested in those uh, four shapes and actually mainly interested in this shape. What do you notice about the shape of this histogram? What does it look like? If someone asks you to describe, you know, this histogram, what would you say here? What does it look like? First thing that comes to mind. Uh, pyramid has to be a 3D shape. Other than pyramid, what uh, would you say? Start with the letter S. It's symmetrical. Symmetric. It has a shape of something you should be familiar with. It starts with B. B as in boy. Then E. Then L. What would that be? Bell shaped like this, guys. See, that's a bell shaped curve. Okay, you notice if you have a symmetric graph, the mean and the median and the mode are all the same, right? They are in the center right here. This is the mean, this is the median, and this is the mode. Now, this is one type of graph that we're very, very interested in for the rest of the semester because most data for your information, any data that you collect, it turns out that more, when you try to graph it, it's going to look symmetric. 
Why? Because most of us people share common characteristics. So we're all full almost right here. There are some of us who will go to one extreme and a very few of us will go to the other extreme. So when we graph the data, it turns out to be like this. This is another graph, guys. This is called uniform. Uniform means all the data values have the same frequency. You see all of them at uh, 20. This is uniform. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, uniform uh, data. If you guys have a die which has six faces, if you roll it 600 times, how many times you should expect to get one face up? How many times will you expect to get two face up, three face up, four face up, five face up, six face up? If you do it, what's the expectation? It's a fair die. You roll it 600 times. Would you guys agree with me that we do expect to see the number fair 100 times? 200 times, 300 times, 400 times, and so on and so forth. This is the case of uh, uniform. Uh, there is only a mean in the median, in the middle. There is no mode because when you have more than two or three modes, we say that there are no modes because everything is repeated. You not know, just hear 20 times. One is repeated 20 times, two is repeated 20 times, three is repeated 20 times. We just say there are. There is no mode rather than saying, you know, that everything, is, all the numbers are a mode. So this is a uniform distribution. We're not very much interested in this kind of a distribution. Now, next one. As you can see, this distribution, number three, has a tail toward the left. Watch. You see the tail is going toward the left. This is called the skewed left distribution. And the other one, guys, watch. It has the tail that's going toward the right. This is called skewed right distribution. Now, here is what you need to know about the mean and the median if you have a skewed distribution, whether it is a left distribution or uh, a right distribution. Okay, um, let me uh, explain this to you. The mean, there's, there, there are a couple questions in the homework online where we give you a graph. We label three points A, B, C and tell you which one is the mean, which one is the median and which one is the mode. To find the mode guys is the easiest. You look for the bar that has the tallest bar and then the value underneath should be the mode. So that's easy. The question is, how can you tell which value is the mean and which value is the median? I'm going to make it very easy on you. The mean is always closer to the tail of the distribution. So you can see here, if he labeled three values, the mean is going to be the one toward the tail. If you go this one, this way right here, you can see, guys, there are three values here, and you can see the mean is the closer to the tail. It's right here. And then you have the other two on the other side. Um, that was a question that another question. That was a question that I gave uh, on the final exam last semester. I'll show you something like that. I just gave students a graph and labeled three points. And I asked the students. Which one is the mean, which one is the median, and which one is the mode? Well, it was very easy for students to tell that A must be the mode. And students remember that the mean is closer to the tail since the tail is going to the right, so that must be the mean. And definitely the leftover will be what? The median. And I put a comment uh, in here about uh, uh, the mean and the median. But if you have symmetric guys, it doesn't matter. The mean and the median are exactly the same. Any questions here? Yeah. Um, so how did you know that the mode was like right in the center? Oh, the mode, because I, I looked where's the tallest point, uh, the highest point on the graph. You see? That's the highest yeah. right here. It's always okay. the highest. Right here, it's right here. It must be here, right there. Okay? Okay. So these are the measures 
of uh, center guys that you need to know in section 2.3. You can use your calculator uh, to find them if you like to. You can do them by hand if there is not much uh, work involved. And another summary that I would like to share with you before I wrap this section up that if you have an outlier, you should refrain from using the mean, but use the median instead as a measure of center if you if asked. You can compute both of them, but which one you should release and share with people, it should be the median if you have outliers. If you don't have outliers, the mean is the best. It should be. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. For the mean, how do you know, you said it's closer to the tail, but which like number would it be? Oh no, you wouldn't be able to know. Then I will have to pinpoint those numbers exactly. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Okay. There will be tons of work if I ask you to figure it out on your own. Okay. No, I will. Uh, I will give options. three points and then tell you which one is. Otherwise, oh, that will be a nightmare to try to figure this out. Okay. I agree. That's a good question. Okay. Now, measures of variation, guys. Probably this is something you're not familiar with. Section two point four. Have you heard of standard deviation? That's what you're going to learn in, uh, in this section. Okay. Let me give you this scenario and tell you why we need to learn about the measures of uh, variation. Okay, the, what you learned in section uh, 2.3, it's called measures of center or measures of central tendency. Those measures provide only a partial description of the quantitative data set. Let me give you this scenario here. Consider the following three data sets which contain test scores for students in three different classes. Class one, guys, they had a mean of 75 and a median of 75. Class two has a mean of 75 and a median of 75. So if you find the mean in the median of the third class, you're gonna notice it's 75 and 75. Okay. I need to tell which class performed better or which class uh, had more consistent scores than the others. I wouldn't be able to tell because the mean and the median are exactly the same. So I don't have any even information to try to differentiate between class one, class two, and class three. For this reason, guys, we need to introduce what we call the measures of variation. And the first measure of variation is called the range. You might be familiar with the range. The range is the difference between the lowest value and the largest value in the data set. So if I wanna calculate the range of class one, it's easy if you can tell me which one is the largest value. So it's maximum value minus minimum value. And that will be what? What's the maximum value here? 100. And the minimum value is 50. So 100 minus 50, which is 50. All right. So that is, uh, that is the range of uh, the data set. Uh, if I ask you to find the range of C2, it will be 50. 100 minus 50 as well will be same range. Uh, but if I ask you to find the range of C3, it will be 80 minus 70 is 10. What can you conclude from the range by itself, guys? So range of C2 is 50, range of class 3 is 10. What kind of conclusion you can make just out of the range itself? Any ideas? Any ideas? It looks, when the range is small, guys, it looks to me that the scores are more consistent, closer together than the other classes. And you can notice here, the lowest score is 70, the highest is 80, they're very close together. Whereas here, we go from a failing score to an extremely high score. And it turns out that the range is 
is large, which is 50. The disadvantage of using the range, guys, that it only uses two values in the data set, the lowest and the largest, and it does ignore the rest of the data set. So if you have a data set that has 200 values, you are ignoring 198 values and only considering two values, which is the, the lowest and the largest. That's why it is a measure of variation, but it's not a very good measure of variation. So we're gonna introduce the next measure of variation. It's the highlight of today's lesson. It's called the standard deviation. I will not be asking you guys to compute the standard deviation by hand. I'm gonna show you how to use the calculator, but the example that I'm gonna do with you, I'm gonna show you how to do this by hand, just to have a feel how the standard deviation work. The standard deviation, guys, is a measure of consistency. Mm -hmm. It does tell you how much on average the value is deviated from the mean, how close to the mean and how far or how spread out the values are from the mean. The smaller the standard deviation, the more consistent the data set is. The larger the standard deviation, the less consistent the data set. So the standard deviation is a very, very important measure. It's a measure of consistency. If the standard deviation turns out to be zero, that means all the values are the same. They are all exactly the mean. So I won't ask you to find a standard deviation where I give you a data set where all the values are the same because you can easily say it is uh, zero. I can tell you guys between classes C1, C2, C3, uh, the standard deviation of class C3 was going to be the lowest because the range was the lowest. And uh, I'm going to give you an example, show you how to find the standard deviation by hand. But after that, I will show you how to use the calculator to find the standard uh, deviation. Okay, so just bear with me for a few minutes as I demonstrate how to find the standard uh, uh, deviation. Okay, he wants us to find the standard deviation of uh, class one scores. Okay, let's put the scores right here. And bear with me just to understand the idea of the standard deviation. Okay. Here's how you find it by hand. And then I'll explain the formula, how the formula works. This is a sample, guys. Remember that we're doing a sample. First of all, you find the mean. The mean is already done for you. It's 75. So just put 75 here. Underneath each value. Oh, 100. Then subtract those two values. So x minus x bar. This is the x value. Any value that changes, we call it x. So x minus x bar, what do I get, guys? Negative 25, negative 15. 70 minus 75 is negative 5. 80 minus 75 is 5. 90 minus 75 is 15. 100 minus 75 is 25. So that's the first step. Next step, guys, is square the values. Square what you just got. Negative 25 squared will be 625, 225, 25, 25, 15 is 225, and 25 times 25 is 625. Step four, add them up. So I'm gonna add all those values. Okay, if I add them up, what do I get? If you have a pencil and a paper, you can uh, follow up with me. So you got 625 plus 225, that's 850, 875, 900, 1,125, 1,750. Okay. How many values do we have? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Because it's a sample, the formula says divide by six minus one. As you can see here, it says n minus one. So I'm gonna divide by six minus one. So I get 1,750. You don't have to worry about that when you use the calculator. The calculator will just do the work uh, by itself, divided by five. Okay, let's see what the answer is. 
and then I'll tell you what the standard deviation is. I got 350. And now, standard deviation. There's the formula for this. The standard deviation will be the square root of 350. Where did you get the five from? I missed it. Oh, the sample has six values. One, two, three, four, five, six. You subtract one automatically. So it's six minus one. Okay, thank you. No problem. 350 square root. Okay, it will be 18.7. And let me tell you, there is a, another uh, measure of variation. It's the square of the standard deviation. It's called the variance, which is the 350 by itself. But we are more interested in the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is 18.7. This is how you find the standard deviation by hand. And let me explain... Uh, this formula right here. I was going to put this. But again, guys, as I told you, you don't have to worry about it. It's built into the calculator. You're going to see it in a second how this works. So this is what the formula means. You take each value and subtract x bar, subtract the mean. You square in. This notation means you add summation notation. You divide by n minus 1. To find the standard deviation, you square root the values, which is S here. This is called the standard deviation. From the sample. And this S square means the variance. So the variance is the square of the uh, standard deviation. The good part, guys, is let me show you how you could have done this into uh, using the calculator. So we're going to take class C1 scores, put them into the calculator, mm -hmm. and ask the calculator to do the work for us. Watch. You're going to like this. Uh, clear, stat, edit. I'm going to enter the data. So I got 50. I got 60. I will release also a handout, guys, on how to use the calculator in Chapter uh, uh, 2. You should have it under uh, resources by your instructor today. I already have this ready on how to use the calculator just to do what I'm doing today. Okay, so you put your data in a list. First of all, you have to provide the uh, calculator with a data set. The calculator can do anything if you don't provide a data set. Go to stat. Exactly what I did earlier, guys. Calc. One variable statistic, L1, my data is in L1, nothing, just hit calculate and watch. The first value that you see on top of the screen is the mean, which is 75. The standard deviation is labeled by S, which is 18.7. And that's what we got, right, guys? So S is 18.7. Now, let me tell you what the next value is. It's called sigma. This is a Greek letter, which is 17.078. This is a standard deviation as well, but that would be your answer if what you were given is the population itself. If you were given the entire population data, you will use sigma. If you are given a sample, you will use S as an answer. The calculator doesn't know what you input, whether it, why it came from a sample or from population, so it gives you both answers. If you know that your question says this is a sample, then you use S. If it says a population, your data is the population itself, then you use sigma. Uh, N equals six, how many values were there in the data set? And then the rest of it, I'm not gonna discuss now, we'll use uh, We'll use later in section 2.5 next time we meet. This is the median 75, guys. You can see that. And that's how you find the standard deviation using your uh, uh, calculator. So a conclusion for the variance and the standard deviation, guys. Variance and standard deviation are useful for comparing variability in two data sets. The data set with the larger variance or standard deviation exhibits more variation in uh, the data. The standard deviation has an advantage over variance. It provides a measure of variability using the same units as the data set. If your data set is in dollars, 
the unit of the standard deviation is also in dollars, but if you do the variance, guys, the unit will be dollar squared. And dollar squared doesn't make any sense to us. What's a unit dollar squared? What can you use this for? So that's why it's always good to use uh, the standard deviation rather than using the variance. Um, the notation for the variance of the population, the standard deviation from a population. I'm gonna give you just those notations. Standard deviation of population. We use this symbol, guys. Sigma. You read it as sigma, and that's what the calculator uh, uh, displayed. I'm gonna give you this example and show you how important the standard deviation is. Let's say, guys, you work as a basketball team coach and you wanna hire a new player. And you have two players being interviewed, player one and player two. You went through videos and watched their past game records and you got the following information for player one. Player one, let's say on six games, had the following scores. One game he got 11 points, another game he got 35 points, then 10, then 18, then 29 points, then 10, how many do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Player two, you watch six games, you know, just that player two played and you uh, got the following results. Here's my question to you guys. If you are concerned about the consistency of the player, you wanna hire a player, when you put him on the ground, you wanna make sure that this player will give you the points that you do expect to get out of him. Which player would you hire if consistency was a criteria for you? How would you figure this out? Player one or player two, guys? What would you say? Let's see what we have here. Player two, and why Why do you guys think player two? I agree, it is player two, why? How do you convince someone that you need to hire player two? Okay. Not better scores, no. Player one in some cases at 35 points in one game, 29 points in another game. More consistent, what does more consistent mean? Exactly, you find the standard deviation, the one that has a smaller standard deviation is more consistent. And I'm gonna show you guys, you're gonna be surprised to see the values of the standard deviation. So let's do this together. Okay, I'm gonna do the standard deviation for both players. Let's turn the calculator on and put the values there. Stat, edit. Okay. I'm going to put the values for player one. So I got 11, 35, 10, 18, 29, and then 10. Any guesses, guys, what do you think the standard deviation will be for player one? And let's put you can type it in, I'll check, see if you're gonna be at. In L2, I'm gonna put uh, other player, 19, 17, 21, 18, 19, and then 20. Okay, guys, there's the data. And now we're gonna ask the calculator to find the standard deviation. I think the standard deviation is gonna be very large for player one, you will see. So go to stat. Edit, uh, sorry, calc, one variable statistics. That's the only feature that you use in chapter two, one variable statistics. Is my data in L1? Yes. Okay, just calculate and watch, guys. You see the standard deviation S? It's a sample because we got six games out of hundreds of games that the player did, so it's 10.8. Let me write it down.
Any guesses, guys, before I do the next one? What do you think the answer is going to be for the standard deviation? Give me a guess. A number. Definitely less than 10.8. What would you say? No, 8 is too much. That's large. That's close to 10.8. It has to be smaller. But look at the values, guys. They're very close together. If they're very close together, standard deviation is going to be very low. Okay, let's do it. Less than seven, I'm sure. Probably less than three, too. So stat, edit. Okay. Uh, this is the data right here. So just go to stat, calc. Okay, one variable statistic. Okay, if I just keep going here, it's going to give me the same answer as before. Now I need to tell the calculator that I'm using L2. Here's how you do it, guys. It's very easy. Watch. You press the second key, and then you press number two. And watch. It changed to two. And now go to calculate. You're ready. I think it's going to be a very low number. Watch. 1.4. This is S1, S2, 1.4. Higher player two because he has lower standard deviation. All right, guys. So that's about the standard deviations. Uh, I guess um, I'm just gonna do one more thing and then uh, we'll be done for, okay. Without performing any calculations, determine which measure of central tendency best represent the graph data. Explain your reasoning. Okay, what do you think of graph 37, guys? What type of data is involved in 37? Do you guys agree with me? This is a survey, responses to the survey. There is no quantitative data. People answered always, sometimes, rarely, never. So this is a qualitative. The best measure here to use is the mode. And what do you think the mode is here, guys? It is that the most common response was always, because you can see it has the tallest one. What about 38? Does the data look like a symmetric data set? Yes, it does. And if you have a symmetric data set, guys, the mean would be the best. 39, any ideas for 39? What do you think? Does it look symmetric as well? Yes, no? Yes, so if it is symmetric, you can use the mean. When you have a bell-shaped symmetric data, the mean would be, uh, would be a good measure. But I'd like you now to look at 40. Would you guys agree with me that there could be an outlier there? You see all the data set is close together and all of a sudden you have a value of 30 toward the right. This is a skewed data. When it is a skewed data, we should use the median instead. Okay, so this is, uh, this is an example on uh, how to use the graphs, you know, to make decision of which measure you should be uh, using. Let me show you another, uh, okay, that would be the last one. Can you guys tell me which data set has, uh, you are asked to compare three data sets without to determine which data set has the greatest sample standard deviation and which data set has the least sample standard deviation. Okay. Which data set, guys, you think has the smallest standard deviation? Is it one I, two I's, or three I's? Let's see what students said here. 
I, do you guys agree it's a three because the smallest standard because the data sets are very close together so there seem to be lots of consistency in uh, three because the data are closer together and which data set guys would have the largest standard deviation it is number two you see how the data is spread out too much to the right too much to the left and then I think uh, number one will come in the middle in between. So yes, three, uh, three has the lo lowest standard deviation. Uh, two has the largest standard deviation. And then uh, one has the standard deviation right in the middle. This is how you can tell from the picture, guys. The more, the, the more spread the data, the larger the standard deviation. This is what I like to get out of today's lesson so with this guys we'll uh, end our discussion